program for you. Uh, today's event is the uh, second in our year-long series of We Stand Against Hate. Uh, this is the second year of the program of We Stand Against Hate at Brooklyn College. As you know, this program is designed to elevate discourse on controversial and challenging political topics. It's designed to enhance empathy across difference, and it's designed to help foster an inclusive environment on the campus. Uh, to date, we've had more than 30 We Stand Against Hate events here at Brooklyn College, and we are especially pleased about today's event. We are um, honored to have with us Rabbi Michael Lerner. He is the editor of Tikkun Magazine, which is a progressive Jewish and interfaith magazine. He is the rabbi of Bet Tikkun Synagogue in Berkeley, California, and the author of several books. We've got two of them with us today. One, Embracing Israel-Palestine, a strategy to heal and transform the Middle East. The second, The Left Hand of God, Taking Back America from the Religious Right. And the third I want to mention is with Cornell West, called Jews and Blacks, Let the Healing Begin. Rabbi Lerner's history of scholarship and activism for social justice is substantial. Uh, during his studies at Berkeley in the 1960s, he became a leader of the free speech movement uh, on campus, which uh, is widely recognized as the first mass civil disobedience uh, activism on college campuses. Uh, so relevant today, so important today. Um, it was also connected, as you know, the free speech movement with the burgeoning civil rights movement uh, in our history. Rabbi Lerner was actively involved in the anti-war movement, organizing meetings featuring the leading figures of the day in the anti-war movement, including his uh, lifelong friend, Muhammad Ali, uh, with whom he became very close, who was both an activist and, as you know, a boxing legend. Since that time, Rabbi Lerner has remained active in a range of social change movements in the United States, merging his training as a psychotherapist and philosopher to study the ethical issues facing society today. Yesterday, I had the real pleasure of meeting Rabbi Lerner at my house in the late afternoon. It was a beautiful day like today, and he showed up early. And I thought we'd take a walk around the block and take in uh, the neighborhood Halloween decorations. <laughs> and uh, I began the conversation by saying, you've led such an interesting life as sort of an opening to talk about his amazing life. And he said, oh, but you know already about me, and I don't know anything about you. <laughs> and he began to ask me questions about me, trying to figure out who I am, and how I tick. And it is this uh, selflessness, this spiritual commitment to community, to the other, which he embodies in his work, uh, and embodies in his personal dialogues with people that he meets. Um, during the uh, reception last night, uh, a number of us wanted to say, oh, you are so wonderful and, and your work is so important. And he basically said um, uh, very modest things about himself when he spoke of himself at all. Uh, he's an extraordinary spiritual leader and a generous spirit in this world today, which is so crucial, so much of what we need to hear. Today, Rabbi Lerner will discuss the psychopathology in American life that creates a climate in which racism and anti-Semitism can fester, and also uh, strategies to take this country in a different direction, in a better direction, a healthier direction. Following his talk, we will have a dinner reception upstairs in the penthouse. I want to thank uh, the wonderful Leonard Kurse for bringing Rabbi Lerner here today. Thank you, Len. It, uh, you are a blessing to our community again and again, so thank you. We are deeply honored to have Rabbi Lerner here with us today. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> I'm very honored to be here with you today. Um, it was great meeting your president, um, and you're very lucky to have her as the leader of this uh, community. Um, and uh, yeah, I asked about you, and you're a terrific person, amazing person. So 
Um, uh, and in the meeting last night, I met some other such, so it's wonderful to um, have the opportunity to get to know some of you at Brooklyn College. Um, and I want to pass around a few copies of Tikkun, so um, okay. just, you can look through them, thank, thank you, um, and uh, then pass it back to other people so they get a sense of what this magazine is. Tikkun is a Hebrew word, it means to heal, repair, transform, and Tikkun Olam uh, is the um, injunction to heal, repair, and transform the world. I've been doing it for, uh, I, I founded the magazine 32 years ago, and uh, I haven't succeeded. <laughs> um, so some people ask me, well, how do you keep going, you know? And I say, well, we've had 3,200 years of the Jewish people's uh, attempt to do this. And um, uh, building on that, uh, I, I can accept that uh, I might not see the end of that in my lifetime. Um, but um, I'm hoping that we will make some more advances. So to address the issues of, um, that uh, I'm supposed to talk about, but I hope to get to eventually, um, I want to um, start by saying you can't understand what's going on right now in American politics or in global politics without understanding um, a struggle that has been going on for the past 10,000 years in human history. And it's a struggle about the nature of what it is to be a human being. Um, and there are two contending worldviews that have been around for uh, ever since um, class societies and um, patriarchy emerged. Um, so here are the, the two. The first view about what it is to be a human being um, says this. Each of us gets thrown into this world by ourselves, and um, uh, we find ourselves surrounded by people who are primarily self-interested, in, uh, and they are interested in advancing their interests and will seek to dominate people in order to and control other people in order to maximize their own advantage. In such a world, your task, if you want to um, uh, if you want to thrive, survive in this world, you've got to learn those same, same techniques and in, learn ways to dominate and control others or else be sure that you're going to be dominated and controlled. And um, so this is, it's up to you which of those two paths you want to go, but um, the rational person on this theory is a person who is um, learning the strategies of domination and control and then using them effectively for their own uh, self-interest. And communities, in the, on this view, are communities that come together to mutually support each other to uh, dominate and control other people. And um, so out of this comes a politics. Homeland security is achievable through being successful in dominating and controlling others. In that worldview, by the way, there's, uh, there are um, differences about what the best strategy is for how to do that. Um, in, in the contemporary America, for example, there are those who think that the um, primary way to succeed in, the, uh, in that strategy is through military conquest or military power. Um, and that's most of the Republican Party and a section of the Democratic Party. Um, and then there are others who, who believe that the most uh, successful way to do that is uh, through um, economic penetration, cultural penetration, um, uh, diplomatic, uh, diplomatic power. Um, but these are, they are not differing. The two sides of the, inside this worldview do not differ on the goal. They only differ on what's the most effective means to achieve that goal of domination and control, advancing your own interest at the expense of others. So I call this the worldview of domination or power over. In the book, I, I call it the right hand of God just because uh, there's this psalm in the, in the Bible that says, your right hand of God, your right hand is full of power. Psalm 118. Um, so, um, 
And it's, you've probably heard this point of view articulated in your life because almost everybody on the planet has heard it. It's a wide, very widespread uh, vision of how to achieve, um, how to um, lead a rational life. To get, lead a rational life, you learn the skills of domination, control, manipulation of others to advance your own interests, whether it be in your individual life or in your community's life. Now, <clears throat> contending as an alternative to that is a different worldview. And this uh, worldview, which uh, um, I call the left hand, um, not because of identifying with the left in politics, because um, sometimes there are people on the left who think that they can achieve their goal through domination and control also, or manipulation of others. But rather, uh, this, le this other view, this other worldview says, um, you know what, um, most of the people that we know um, didn't really come into the world by themselves. They came into the world through a mother, a mother, okay? There was um, uh, some, somebody who birthed you, and in the first three years of your life, um, you survived because your mother or your mothering other, it could have been a man, it could have been a, it, it could have been a surrogate for your, somebody who took care of you. And uh, we in psychology um, had sets of uh, experiments that showed that um, actually when, um, when the, a baby is not picked up and cared for, that they die from failure to flourish, failure to flourish they used to call it. Um, um, and in any event, that um, you literally would not have survived without somebody giving you a certain amount of caring. A lot of people, when they hear this, will come up to me afterwards and say, Rabbi Lerner, you don't know my mother. <laughs> and, and so I want to stipulate at the start that, you know, anybody who has that feeling that you're, you're I'll stipulate that your mother was as neurotic as you thought she was, but nevertheless gave you a good enough mothering to have made it possible for you to survive. And um, from that experience comes a, um, a different worldview. And that worldview says that um, the way to um, flourish in this world, uh, the rational path for survival in this world, is a path um, that can come through caring for others, through generosity, um, through a um, through a, a loving attitude towards others, so <clears throat> and that alternative worldview gave birth to a whole variety of religious traditions that had this as a part of its uh, its message to the world that the world could be made safe if there was more love, if there was more caring, if there was more generosity. Now, the. In the, um, in the struggles between these two worldviews over the course of the past uh, 10,000 years, very often the power over worldview, since it was using force and violence, um, was able to make its case more effectively, let's say, um, or at least to win over many, many people, including many people in religious traditions, so that I know of no religious tradition, I could be wrong though, and maybe you'll tell me about it later, Actually, I'll take it back because I know Baha'i and whatever. But most, most religious traditions have both voices in it. So, um, <clears throat> so that there's no, there really is no one religious tradition that is purely the left hand of God perspective, of uh, the perspective of love, generosity, and caring. Because um, over and over again, people have gotten despairing over that uh, view and have been um, won over to the power over view. And even inside of religions, that ostensibly support the, um, the love and caring perspective, but actually um, many of its leaders, uh, its priests, its rabbis, its, uh, its ministers, its whatever you call them, were in different religions, where the leaders um, end up, um, many of them siding with the right hand world, uh, uh, the, the view of domination as uh, a central part of their message. In any event, these two views are <clears throat> in constant struggle with each other. And the struggle <clears throat> is um, going on, not just on some uh, intellectual level, but inside almost every human being on the planet. 
because almost every one of us has both voices in our head. Both voices have been, are there. And we are someplace at any given moment on a continuum between the voice of domination and the voice of love and generosity. And where we are at any given moment is partly a product of, well, how, how much loving did you get in that childhood? How quickly were you introduced into the world of domination? How much in your schooling was the world of domination given more credit than the world of love and, and caring? By the way, do we have any more seats for people back here? Maybe we should bring a few more chairs in. Oh, good. Seats right here. Great. Thank you. Oh, welcome. Um, so, so um, most people have heard both of these worldviews. And one of the factors in where you are in the continuum at any given moment is how much love you got as a child. Second factor is how much, what kind of experiences you had as an adult. How, how often were you treated as um, a being who deserves love and caring? And how, much, how often did you have experiences that were um, manipulative, dominating, <laughs> seeking, their, uh, seeking their, their own goals at the expense of you, trying to get, get something from you? Um, we're walking over here, and uh, um, uh, one of the women in the, walking over here was saying, there, you know, there isn't a woman on the planet, or certainly not in the United States, who hasn't experienced endless, uh, endless times what we're seeing with uh, the, um, the show in uh, Hollywood right now of exploitation, of domination, of manipulation, of being touched without, without uh, wanting to be touched, and, and so forth. So. Um, it's, you know, it's out there very much in people's experience that, that that's happening. So how much of that has happened to, to lead people to then believe, well, this is just how it is. It's a world full of people who are seeking to get what they can for us without caring about who we are as human beings. A third factor is what worldviews we've been taught. Because uh, very often you get, um, people are seeing over and over again in the media um, the television shows, the sitcoms, etc. Uh, often the sitcoms are about who is going to manipulate the other to get what they want. And uh, it's often presented in a humorous way, but actually that, uh, whether they're, they're after money, whether they're after sex, whatever they're after, um, and then uh, it's presented in a humor, humorous way, but the humor in part is because supposedly all the viewers realize, yeah, that's how the world is, and we're getting to see the real world, but it's being put, couched in a, in a softer way, in a humorous way, but that's the reality of the world. Versus how much times did we hear worldviews presented that articulated um, the love, kindness, and generosity worldview? So that has another factor in where we are in this continuum at any given point. If you're religious, how much, what part of the religion did you hear? Mostly the domination or mostly the love parts? And finally, there's the question of where is social energy moving? Because when social energy is moving more towards fear, um, then the voices in our head that tell, say that this is the way the world is get dramatically reinforced. After 9-11, uh, that was massively reinforced in, uh, in the West. Um, now, this is not something that is just built into the structure of reality. Um, it's a choice about how you view any reality. So let's take 9-11 because uh, you'd think, well, wait a second, uh, how else could we re react? Well, imagine a different president uh, than the one we had um, going on television and saying the, the next day, you know, yesterday we had um, several thousand uh, people killed in our society and it's a huge tragedy. And um, we need to focus our energy on the, the thousands and thousands of people who are willing to sacrifice their life to care for other people. And tens of thousands of people who came out to assist and try to in some way participate in saving people. And all around the world, millions, hundreds of millions of people sending us uh, um, remarks of caring and support and like that. So I want you to know, my fellow Americans, that we're not gonna give a victory to the, to the um, terrorists by saying that the world is like them, because it's not like them, it's actually 
uh, like the people who made all those sacrifices and the people who stood up against it. A different message, right? A very different kind of message that would have reinforced a different kind of worldview. You see what I'm talking about? Anybody see? <laughs> so, um, so this is, um, so everybody is on this, uh, and where the social energy moves, well, the social energy moved more towards hope um, in, the mid, uh, in, in the mid part of the first decade, and people decided, okay, we're gonna go with uh, Obama for president. And uh, then when Obama failed to come through with many of the things that he had promised or the, the hopes that he had raised, uh, energy started to move it back in the opposite direction, more towards fear again. So part of where we are at any given moment is influenced by where social energy is moving as well. Um, so this is uh, one factor that you have to take into account whenever you're thinking about politics. Whenever you hear anybody give a, give a talk, give a, any college professor give, giving a lecture, any television show you see, any movie you see, any novel you read, any, any, any uh, novelistic movie or, or a sitcom or uh, whatever, always ask yourself, will this professor, will this um, talk, will this movie, will this book Move, uh, does it move people more towards fear or more towards hope? More towards believing in domination or more for, towards believing in the possibility of a different kind of world, a world of love and generosity? So this is uh, a, a, an important framework that if you take nothing away from what I'm saying, use this to assess what's going on in politics in, and, and not just in politics because every aspect of life has, has this dynamic in it use this uh, framework. Okay, now the second thing I wanna say is that um, um, I was uh, um, an activist, social change activist in the 60s and uh, have been pretty much so ever since. And at a certain point I decided I needed to understand the psychodynamics of American society. And so I got a PhD in clinical psychology and, um, um, and then did a study, um, uh, financed by the National Institute of Mental Health, although I don't think they knew exactly what they were financing. Um, but I did the part that I said I was gonna do for them, but I did a lot more. And over the course of uh, 10 years of work in the Institute for Labor and Mental Health, which is the organization that I continue to be the executive director of, um, we uh, interviewed and had groups of people that went on for several weeks, 10 weeks usually, um, uh, learning about the psychodynamics in their lives of middle-income working people. And a particular focus that I, I was concerned about was trying to understand why people were moving to the right when their economic interests were with the left. And um, so um, what I learned was the following. I asked, we learned about the lives of people in this, uh, um, in middle income working people and their experience. And here's what they told us. Um, this was, by the way, a uh, study that eventually included thousands and thousands of middle income working people. Um, that every day they go into a world of work in which they uh, find themselves surrounded by others who are looking out for themselves and seeking to advance themselves in the world of work and to do that, they have to convince those who have power in that world of work that um, they can contribute to the bottom line of money and power in that institution. And um, either directly or indirectly that their work group will, um, will eventually contribute in such a way as to maximize their financial success. 90% uh, of people work in those kinds of institutions. About 10% work in the nonprofit sector and those in the nonprofit sector, it's not so much money, it's the ego of the people on the top usually. But um, for the rest, uh, it, it is uh, a lot about contributing to the, um, uh, con contributing to uh, the bottom line of money and power. And they find, them, find themselves either in their, uh, immediately in the people they work with, or at least in the competition between work groups, they find themselves uh, in a situation in which they see that most people there are not there to help them advance, they're there to advance themselves. So all day long, 
day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, they are absorbing the, the ethos of the world of work. And that ethos of the world of work is um, look out for number one, maximize your own advantage, um, yeah, and get ahead. And, uh, and if you don't do that, you may lose your job. In fact, you often will lose your job. But if you don't lose your job, you certainly won't advance in this workplace and you won't get more opportunities to use your intellectual capacities or any of the capacities that you have. You have to stick with a job, the lower level jobs that give, give you less opportunity to be fully yourself. Coming home from this, um, uh, we learned something very interesting. That most people who are in these, these workplaces um, come out of them uh, hating that this is the, real, the, the world, hating that this is what they have to do all day, and yet at the same time believing that it is totally impossible to change it because it seems as though everyone else is acting in the same way and that this hence constitutes reality. And um, so they have this conflicted feeling on the one hand, okay, I need a job, I need, the, need this work, etc. And on the other hand, I really don't like what this is all about. And, this, um, and yet at the same time, they also think, and yet everybody's like this, everybody's out for themselves. And so unconsciously often, but through the group process that we were doing, it became more conscious for people, they would tell us about the ways in which they themselves started to embody in their rest of their lives the ethos of the world of work. Um, most people spend, most people from the ages of 20 to 65 spend most of their waking hours in the world of the work. And so the dynamics in that are not, uh, not surprisingly brought home into personal life. And they are dramatically reinforced by the media, the sitcoms, etc., uh, that, uh, that they watch that seem to reinforce the notion that everybody is like that and that that's what everybody wants. Um, and that uh, so much so that often um, they'll feel that there's something wrong with them if they feel uncomfortable with that reality. And so the parts of them that actually yearn for a different kind of world, for a world of love, for caring, for generosity, in other words, for this, this left-hand view of the world, um, starts to feel like um, not only that it's unrealistic, but that it's problematic, and maybe they better not share it with anybody else, because other people will think they're crazy, or, or at least that they are um, so uh, unhappy with their lives that there's something really wrong with them. And so most people learn to not even talk about this. Instead to put on a, an external facade of, oh yeah, things are great, I'm doing, I'm doing fine, etc. And rarely do they talk about the, the pain that they're in in this situation uh, the, and the frustration that they're in. Or eventually they're able to block it out of their mind and just feel the pain and frustration but not really connect it with what they've been doing all day. And they use various things, uh, um, drugs, alcohol, um, other forms of addictions, television, Facebook today, um, other forms of addiction that um, keep them from being in touch with their own feelings about this. Um, and this inevitably corrodes loving relationships as well. Because as people increasingly bring the ethos of the marketplace into the rest of their lives, they see other people through that framework of um, what's in it for me. And so increasingly, um, and this is more each generation that is more influenced by the dominant culture, the dominant culture is more and more and more powerful, the more you're likely to hear this, that people are saying, look, I'm entering a relationship, uh, I'll, I'll get married, um, because this person will take care of more of my needs than anybody else that I'm, is likely to fall for me in the short run. But that has the consequence of uh, making uh, um, marriages very unsteady. It used to be that people entered marriages and thought, okay, this is resolved now, I've got a partner for life. But if you enter into uh, marriages uh, with the consciousness of the marketplace, who's gonna satisfy more of my needs? Um, then very often, what you find is, well, we had someplace between 40 and 50% of marriages ending up in divorce. Um, and most people, even those that don't end in divorce, feel very insecure even in their marriages. Why? Because they can't be sure that at some point, 
their partner wouldn't find somebody else whom they believe, rightly or wrongly, would satisfy more of their needs. And if that such person exists, uh, then th it's the rational thing to do if you're a rational maximizer of self-interest which is what you're supposed to be doing, what you should have learned all day in the world of work. If you're a rational maximizer of self-interest, you leave that relationship for another one. Um, do, again, do you see what I'm saying? So this, um, so th now I am not putting down anybody who's been divorced. I've been divorced, okay? Um, I'm not putting down anybody who's been divorced or who, who's made this choice. I'm saying that it's almost impossible in this society to see another, to be in another way, to not have already internalized the looking out for number one attitude of, of the world. Um, and um, then to um, act accordingly and weakening relationships, weakening loving relationships. Now I say it's almost impossible, but it's not impossible because there is another way of looking at, uh, at the world and looking at people, other human beings. And that's what we call a spiritual consciousness. The spiritual consciousness goes like this. Um, I see you as being created in the image of God, or if you don't believe in God, as being um, a sacred being, as somebody who is valuable just because of who you are as a human being, and not because of what you can deliver to me, what you can give to me. And um, but that consciousness, that spiritual consciousness, is hard to come by, and there's only one place where it's really articulated very strongly, and that is in the churches, the synagogues, the mosques, or the, uh, the zendos, the, uh, the religious world. It's the only place uh, that is an institution that is set up to articulate and to say, you are valuable just because you are a human being and not because of what you can do for us, but just because of who you are. And hence, many of these people um, that we were interviewing were telling of going to churches, in, and primarily right-wing churches, um, where, uh, where they were hearing uh, that message, even though there were lots of other messages that weren't so great. Why? Because um, in that place, they were being uh, given validation for who they are. Now, I want to add on another level of what was so important about this validation of who you are. And that is that um, not only are people um, facing difficult, uh, difficulties in seeing friends, friendship relationships being so much about exchange, get, I get something from you, and ex rather than solidarity, caring for the other. Um, marriages ending up in divorce insecurity all over the place. But they also have internalized another critical element of the ideology of the society. And here I step back for a second to give yet another dimension. Sorry to have to make a complex argument, but anyway, this is... So the next element is, you know that this is a society with vast economic inequality. That, um, that the top 1% Certainly the top 10% owns more wealth than the other 90% of the population. Um, that there's vast economic inequality in the society. How, does, how, how, does, um, the, how do the top earners, the top wealthy people, get away with this? When there's democratic means available to transform that. The answer is that they have succeeded in the past several hundred years of convincing everybody that you live in a meritocracy. Meritocracy. Meritocracy means that the society is built in such a way that those who make it, make it because they have merit. They've worked harder, they're smarter, and because they've worked harder and smarter, that's why they have the more money. And the converse of that is, and if you didn't make it, it's because you did something wrong, or you are something wrong, <laughs> okay? You are something wrong, or you did something wrong. You failed in some way. Um, you, uh, you, and so, you have nobody to blame but yourself. Now this message is not just given, um, it's given even starting from the par your parents. Uh, most parents are, have, and their parents, and their parents before them, and so forth. This is the central ju self-justificatory, the self-justification of a class society. Of, of the contemporary, the capitalist class societies. 
because in earlier periods, they just said, look, you're born into this and this, you're stuck in it and there's no, no movement. But in capitalist societies, they, they, this is the primary self-justification of the society. You deserve where you, um, you've created your own reality and you deserve it. And this is massively reinforced. Your parents are saying to you, hey, you know what, if you study hard and you work hard, you can really succeed in this world. It's, it, you know, the society is based on merit and they may not use that word, but they're saying, you know, study hard, work hard, um, uh, pay attention, um, suck up to the teachers if you have to, whatever you have to do, get a, it because you can make it. But the truth of the matter is, is that there is very little class mobility, not no class mobility, there is some, but very, very little class mobility in the society. So, um, so why aren't people rebelling against it? Because instead, they're rebelling against themselves. They're telling themselves the story, the meritocratic story that they've heard since they were two or three years old, of, hey, you can, you can be incredible, you can be anybody, you can be very successful in society. And hey, look, we even, even Obama became president, so don't think that racism is a factor. You know, any place, you can get any place in this society if you work hard and you... Um, so, um, this story is deeply internalized by everyone. Uh, we found that um, virtually everyone in, in our study, and not just people in bad jobs, but even people in relatively good jobs who nevertheless were saying, yeah, but if I had really been a, a this, that, or the other thing, I would have had an even better job, and I, or I'd have even more money, or I'd have even more success, etc." The self-blaming is so deep in the, in the consciousness, and it's reinforced by various forms of, uh, of pop spirituality and pop psychology, which say to you, Hey, you make your own reality. Well, if you make your own reality, the flip side of that is that if your reality isn't so good, you've got nobody to blame but yourself. In other words, it eliminates any sense of what the actual restraints are uh, that you're facing and the actual forms of social organization that keep you in your place. So this makes so when people are in the situation where they're frustrated and unhappy they often feel terrible and blame themselves. Now here comes the right wing, the, and this is the terrible, terrible uh, part of the, of, the, of the story that's very complicated to get. The right wing comes forward and says, you are not to blame. You are not to blame for the pain in your life. And the reason you're not to blame is, and then they fill in, whoever are the demeaned others of the society in whatever society you're in. In, the, in Western societies, in, in Europe, it was the Jews who were primarily to be blamed. They had introduced selfishness and materialism. They're the ones who are looking out just for themselves. If you find yourself surrounded by selfishness, materialism, and you're, and you're feeling like nobody really cares about you, blame the Jews. In the United States, well, we started out with Native Americans and African Americans and particularly African Americans, it has persisted over hundreds of years of saying, they're the ones to blame, they're the, the evil people. But in the past 30 to 40 years, it has extended as the contradictions in life have been more in, intense, the, it has extended to saying it's, it's uh, women who are, uh, feminist women who are looking to change, uh, overcome patriarchy, they're only caring about themselves. They don't care about anybody else. So they're the ones who are introducing selfishness into the society. Or gays and lesbians. Now, why gays and lesbians? Well, they're not raising the next generation. By the way, not true. Many, many gays and lesbians are raising the next generation. But anyway, they're saying, because they're not raising the next generation, so they're just looking out for themselves. Uh, then, uh, added on in the more last 10, 10, 15 years, it's been um, uh, Muslims coming to this country. And it has been uh, undocumented workers or refugees of various sorts. And you can name others, right? I've probably forgotten them. Somebody can get up and say, why didn't you mention Bob? Okay, they're, they're, you know, it's, um, there, there's, um, uh, it's an expandable list of people. Now, and here's, the, so I'm saying here's the terrible thing about this. It actually does reduce self-blaming. It makes people feel better about themselves to not have to blame themselves and to, and to put the blame onto some other 
and this is core to the success of racism, sexism, homophobia, etc. Now, don't get me wrong. There are many other strands to racism, sexism, and homophobia, and all the other uh, xenophobia, anti-Semitism, etc., that are there. But this is an important element, okay? This is an important element in why they stick, why they, have, they continue to have attraction. It's because actually it feels good to be relieved of self-blame. Now, you might say, wait a second, if that's true, why isn't the liberal and progressive forces in there um, saying, hey, you know what, this spiritual crisis that you're talking about, there's another way to deal with it. Um, uh, we need to change the society in various ways, and, and it's not really the fault of African Americans and blacks uh, and, and uh, Native Americans and uh, gays, and, gays and lesbians and uh, feminists, and etc. Why, why isn't the left there saying, there's another set of explanations for why you're feeling the way you're feeling, and you, don't, you don't, shouldn't be feeling that. You don't have to feel that, because this meritocracy is not true, and you are not to blame for being in the situation you're in. And the answer is because the liberal and progressive forces, by and large, do not have a clue about the spiritual crisis in this society. They don't even believe it. Instead, what they say is, you see, they take the rights, uh, the rights blaming, and they, and they say, oh no, the spiritual crisis isn't real. That's just, uh, that's just code word for the racism, sexism, homophobia, xenophobia, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, etc. So here's this huge error, because in not because those um, those uh, groups that are being attacked are being um, are being attacked not because people have a natural instinct to attack them, but because they have been uh, helped on that path. Um, at least a major part of helping them on that path has been the way in which it has been presented to them. In, by the right, and um, that, so there's a real problem in the society with a phony solution. But if you don't understand the real problem, namely that people have learned to look at other human beings primarily from the standpoint of what they can get from them, and that that is intrinsic to, at, to the capitalist market, and that they then end up blaming themselves for not being more successful, instead, it, instead, it, um, um, if you don't see that that's the critical spiritual crisis that people are in, that then is potentially manipulatable, then you, then you think that the right solution is actually the problem. It is a problem. It's a big problem. But to undermine that problem, you need to understand how people get there. Now, let me repeat that I'm not in any way claiming that um, racism, sexism, homophobia, etc., um, are purely a product of this. Um, on the contrary, there has been a long tradition of sexism and, uh, and uh, homophobia and anti-Semitism and Islamophobia that go through, and, and I can, you know, if we had a few days, I could go trace the whole history of those, re of those realities. So they are part of the cultural inheritance, to be sure. But where they get the power to suddenly override what's actually in people's self-interest, namely to unite with each other and, um, and work to change the social order in such a way that it would be fairer and, more, and everybody would achieve a higher level of success. Um, that comes uh, from the powerful way that the right is able to manipulate these feelings and make people feel better about themselves by blaming it on others. And the left's total failure to understand that this, that this is rooted in a real problem and um, that needs to be addressed and needs to be changed. But to the extent that the left has been formed out of Marxist ideology, out of a, world, a materialist worldview, they don't understand that there is a spiritual crisis. They don't understand this need. In fact, they barely ever articulate that, the, that, uh, that people actually would hunger for a world based on love and caring and kindness and generosity barely ever articulated. So, um, so we started to talk about this in our, in our groups, and people started to get it, and then they would go into and say, okay, well, so we're gonna join the liberal and progressive movements, and, um, and they did. They went into liberal and progressive movements, but they came back to us not so, not so long after and said, we can't be there. 
Why? Well, here are, here are the reasons. Number one, we experience their um, shaming and blaming because um, the way that they're talking in those movements about white working class uh, people or white working class men is a way that is put down it. They assume that because we weren't with them before, that everybody who's not with them must actually be a racist, a sexist, a homophobe. We were going in there just wanting to see what the culture was like and see if we could fit in in some way. But they talk about all the people that I work with in my, in my workplace, in, my, in, in the factory I work in, in, the, in the, uh, the hospital that I work in, and wherever the people were working, in the, in the hotel workers and, uh, um, and uh, people who drive the buses. I mean, we were talking about the working class, right, that, that we were dealing with. It's like we can't fit in there because they have contempt for us. They talk down to us. I mean, uh, that trend, you know, was dramatically reinforced by Hillary Clinton's statement that everybody who's for, you know, uh, half of Trump voters are a bundle of um, uh, uh, deplorables. Uh, deplorables, right, deplorables. But that feeling was conveyed to them. Then the second part of that that gets conveyed to them um, uh, had to do with um, um, the religiophobia. Because it turns out that in much of the liberal and progressive world, um, the message that they got, and they were telling, telling us to us, that they got when they were there was um, that if you're into religion, and say many of these people, um, you know, 60% of Americans still say that they go to church once a month. Now, I don't know if that's true that they actually go to church once a month, but I do know that 60% that still feel that they want to say that. Okay, they want that impression because they, they believe there's something about that institution that is right to identify with, okay? So, um, so they're, they're saying, hey, um, um, here's the experience. I go there and they tell me, um, they, they give me the message that they want me to be for, in their demonstrations. They want me to vote for their candidates. But basically they think that anybody who is religious or spiritual must be on a lower level of intellectual or psychological development. A psychological development, they, maybe they're religious because they need a father figure, it never worked out for them as a kid, so that's why they're into religion. Or on the intellectual level, well, they just aren't that smart. They're pretty stupid to believe this ridiculous stuff. But if you hang out with us long enough, you'll evolve to our higher level. And where you don't believe in any of that religious crap, and you know you've overcome your psychological defects, and you'll be with us, and you're welcome because we want you to evolve to our level. So this elitist message is one that makes people feel, no, I can't be there. It's not now. Um, now then, there's a third thing, and that is. Um, so we said, well, what about the programs that the the, uh, the liberal and progressive forces? Um, uh, support. And they said, um, you know, a lot of them we agree with. And you can see this even uh, in Trump's America today. You see when, when there are um, uh, polls made about specific policy suggestions that are being put forward by the right, the majority of Americans don't support them. So, okay, so then um, uh, why, aren't they, why are they voting in a different way? Why can't you support the liberal and progressive forces? And the answer that we got over and over again was, because they really hate us. And I, in other words, I can't get myself to support people who really think that I'm less than them, that think that I'm no good, that think that I'm uh, stupid. That th and there's a lot of that that goes on in the liberal and progressive world. That message is um, floating around. I don't mean that everybody has it explicitly, Although you'd be amazed at how many people who, who are liberal and progressive have it in the back of their mind that, hey, these people really, if they were smarter, they would have been more successful in their lives. Um, because they too have bought something about their own, their own situation. They bought the, they've drunk the Kool-Aid, they believed in the meritocracy. But that feeling, um, so here's, so I, um, I was going around giving talks around this issue some woman raises her hand at a, at a bookstore event where I'm talking about this, and then she says, yeah, you know what, this just happened to me this weekend. There's this guy I was interested in, he finally calls me up and says, can we go out uh, uh, to breakfast this Sunday morning? And she says, 
oh, I'd love to go out with you, but I, I, I go to church Sunday morning. Could we do it some other time? And he says, church? I thought you were liberal. <laughs> so in other words, the, the, it's so deep in the cult culture of the liberal and progressive world that, um, that people are pushed away. So if you want to really deal with the, the power of hate movements, you've got to change the liberal and progressive world so that they stop being haters also. So that they stop being, uh, having an elitist consciousness. So that, so that they, I should say we, because I'm part of that world, okay? So that we stop having a, an elitist consciousness. Um, and there's one other factor that's very important, and, uh, and that's this, that um, um, the liberal and progressive world knows what it is against, and it is really good at telling all the things that are wrong with the society, but it has very rarely articulated a vision of the world that, you're for, that they're for, that we are for. And I, I say this, Martin Luther King Jr. did not become an icon of social change by giving a speech that said, I have a complaint. <laughs> no, it was a dream of a different kind of world. And that was part of why I and others started the um, Tikkun magazine and then the network of spiritual progressives. This is the organization that Tikkun magazine has, uh, has created. Network of spiritual progressives. Um, and one of the things that we do in this network of spiritual progressives is articulate a vision of the world we want. And I'm going to tell you a, few, a little bit about that, and then I'm pretty much going to get out of here. You know, at least give, uh, hope we have uh, time for some discussion. Is it poss possible? I'm sorry. Um, I, I haven't gone on too long, have I? I've almost gone on too long. All right. So, um, so here's so our central message is this: we need a new bottom line. America needs a new bottom line. In fact, the world needs a new bottom line. Instead of judging every institution, corporation, government policy, um, uh, our education system, our judicial system, uh, whatever system you're talking about, uh, as efficient, rational, and productive, to the extent that it maximizes money or power to, for somebody, instead, judge it efficient, rational, and productive to the extent that it maximizes love and caring kindness and generosity, ethical and ecological sensitivity, caring for each other and caring for the earth, um, enhances our capacity to respond to other human beings as embodiments of the sacred, and enhances our capacity to look at the earth not as a resource for us to use as much as we want, but rather as something that intrinsically deserves to be cared for as a fundament and to stand in awe and wonder of. That's a very different bottom line. And if we had that bottom line, every institution, virtually every institution we have today, would look irrational and ineffective and you know, inefficient and uh, not productive. Okay, so it's, now, why is the old bottom line the bottom line? Well, it's not because they did research and found out that that's what people really want. It turns out that's not true. That actually, most people would prefer to live in a world of love and caring and kindness and generosity. Only they think it's impossible. Now I'll get back to that in a second. But I want to tell you two manifestations of this vision of a new bottom line. So here are two concrete programs. Let's apply this principle to foreign policy. Okay, then what's our foreign policy? Right now our foreign policy is right hand of God. Ma master power over domination and control as the path to homeland security. We say, on the contrary, the path to homeland security is when the United States um, becomes the most uh, famous as the most generous and caring country in the world. When we are perceived around the world as the most generous and caring country, we will be far more successful and far more safe than if we have another Iraq war or another Afghanistan war or, uh, God forbid, a nuclear war with Korea or with Iran. Um, that will not provide us with security. It will only provide us with more people who hate us and who are ready to give their lives to kill us. Um, you want a path to security? The path to security is through caring and generosity for other people. What would that look like? Well, we've developed a thing, a global Marshall Plan. The Marshall Plan was a plan that was instituted after the first, uh, Second World War to help Europe get back in its feet by giving aid 
to building up democratic institutions in those societies. A global Marshall Plan, we lay it out in our website, spiritualpartikun.org slash GMP, if you want to read it. And um, uh, so the global Marshall Plan, uh, an endorsement of the global Marshall Plan was introduced into Congress uh, this past February by um, Representative Keith Ellison. Keith Ellison is the candidate who, uh, the congressman from uh, Minneapolis, who almost became the chair of the Democratic National Committee. He came within 20 votes of being the, the new national chair of the Democratic National Committee. That's been introduced into Congress. He's been working with the Network of Spiritual Progressives. The second part, a second manifestation of this new bottom line is what we call the ESRA, the Environmental and Social Responsibility Amendment to the Constitution. It has the following par parts. Number one, it, um, it, uh, Point number one of the ESRA is that it requires that uh, no money be allowed in politics except that money which is allocated by state legislatures or the Congress equally to all major parties, to all ma major candidates. And all other money from corporations, from nonprofits, from individuals, eliminated. Which means that your Congress people no longer have to spend their time uh, courting the rich convincing the rich, et cetera, that, that, that they will serve their interests in order to get enough money to run the next campaign. The second uh, uh, part of the environmental and social responsibility is this. It's based on the following understanding. You can't get a democratic society as long as corporations, even if, you're there, even if they can't dominate in, with money, nevertheless have huge power because they can always threaten the congress any given congressional district with the following. You know what? If you are going to make us uh, less, um, uh, less successful in accumulating as much money as we want, we'll simply move out of your district or out of your state, or if necessary, we'll move to Taiwan or we'll move to some other country. You see, it's a global market. We don't need here. We don't need to be here. Um, so in relationship to that, most, uh, most localities most, and most elected officials capitulate because they don't want to be responsible for the unemployment that they're they're causing. Okay, that's the background to point number two. So point number two is this. Every corporation with incomes above $50 million a year, so here we're not talking about mom and pop corporations, we're not talking about smaller corporations, we're talking about the big corporations that rule the world. Um, every corporation with incomes above $50 million a year must get a new corporate charter once every five years. And that new corporate charter will only be granted to those corporations that can prove a satisfactory environmental and social history, history of environmental responsibility. Okay, so um, to, to a jury of ordinary citizens who, have been, who get to hear um, testimony from people all over the world who have been affected by that corporation. In other words, you, the corporation can't just say, fine, we've been great for the United States, we're dumping our, uh, all our environmental toxins into Namibia or to, you know, in, into uh, South Korea or into wherever, to other places. No, because these, these, um, uh, those who are in the Environmental and Social Responsibility Amendment um, uh, juries will hear testimony from people all over the world. And that gives an incentive to people in the corporations. Um, see, most people in corporations are not evil people. They're not the bad guys. Mostly, they're in a system in which they have a responsibility to their uh, investors to maximize their investment. So what we're saying to them is, fine, you can't maximize your, your, uh, your you can't fulfill your uh, responsibility to your investors if you don't, if you aren't environmentally and socially responsible in such a clear way that you can convince a jury that they, you've been that in the past five years. And the third part is mandatory uh, uh, in every school um, from kindergarten through graduate school, um, each year a course on uh, appropriate to that grade level on envir the environment and the environmental crisis, so that everybody learns what's going on in the environment and uh, it becomes central to what education is about. So that's the ESRA. Okay, so here you've heard it, the new bottom line, global Marshall Plan, ESRA, and of course the response that you're likely to have is, is this guy serious? I mean. Does he really think this is possible? I mean, this is so um, this, this is so unrealistic, and um, uh, so I want to stop, step back from that for a second, and say, yes, it is unrealistic from the standpoint of um, 
who, those who define what realistic is, namely those who are in the corporations, those who are in the media, and those who are your elected political representatives, including very many good guy people, good, good women, good <laughs> men in elected office, who uh, are thinking in terms of, well, given the way power is configured at this moment, this can't ever happen, so there's no point in even thinking about it. Um, but the truth is that every fundamental change that's ever happened in this society has happened because um, people were willing to stand up for something that they believed in that was totally unrealistic at the time. So when slavery was, uh, the, when the debate about slavery was taking place, people were saying we want to eliminate slavery. It was very unrealistic for those people who were in the anti-slavery movement for the first 20 or 30 years. Everybody around them was saying, you're crazy, it'll never happen. Similarly, segre ending segregation. Most of the people, even other, other religious leaders uh, around Martin Luther King Jr. were saying, this is very unrealistic. You'll never, um, you'll never stop segregation, so stop giving these, uh, stop giving these fiery sermons and encouraging people to go out in the streets and, uh, and fight against segregation. It's totally unrealistic, it'll never happen. Similarly, ending apartheid in, uh, in uh, South Africa. Similarly, uh, um, gays and lesbians getting the right to, to marry. In each case, when people start to articulate these ideas, most of their, not just enemies, most of their friends were telling them, it's unrealistic, don't go for it. So what I want to say to you about all of this is, you want to end hate in this society? Don't be realistic. Don't be realistic. Don't waste your time on this planet, whatever, how much time it is. For young people, maybe another 70 years of your life. Don't waste your time on, on this planet fighting for what is, uh, what people tell you is realistic. Instead, go for your highest vision of the good, whatever that vision it is. I'm saying that vision could be, and I invite you to join our network of spiritual progressives, and uh, you'll find it on the web, spiritualprogressives.org. Anybody in this room who wants to join, there's a, a fee to join, it's a sliding fee scale, but if it's too much, all you have to do is write to me and say, I want to join, I want to be part of your movement, and uh, you can join for free. It's got, but money is not our bottom line, we have no money. <laughs> so, that would be our bottom line. <laughs> we, we have, we're, we're, we all have no money, so uh, money is not our bottom line. Our bottom line is solidarity. I want to invite you to, to join, to read Tikkun Magazine, same thing. My email is rabbilearner.tikkun, T-I-K-K-U-N, at gmail.com, and you can get it from me later uh, if you want. That's my private email. Just write me and say, hey, I heard you speak at Brooklyn College. I want to join, or I want to get a subscription to Tikkun, and I don't have enough money to pay for it. Fine. I, as I say, be part of it, and if not part of us, then a part of some movement. Don't be realistic. Go for your highest vision of the good, because it's only when you, uh, because you never, in terms of what is realistic, you actually never know what is realistic until you have spent years and years fighting for what is desirable, for what you really believe in. And it turns out that so much of the advances that have made in human history, and certainly in the past uh, uh, 50 years, have happened because people went for what was unrealistic and put their life energies into it. I invite you to do, do the same thing. And I believe that in doing that, you will make a major contribution to ending hate on this planet. Thanks.